Warning, this podcast has stories of real-life events and true crime that happens every day. These stories may contain adult language and graphic or disturbing details not suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. In our society, most people are content to go through their daily lives safely and peacefully. But our society is not always safe or peaceful. For that reason... Some men and women answer a higher calling to defend and protect their fellow man. You probably know someone who is one of these people, or maybe you are one of these people. The ones who see and do the things most people would never want to. These things are sometimes heroic and beautiful, but often they are horrific and terrifying. It's these things they don't share about with other people. It's these things they carry with them, so you don't have to. But when they get together, they talk to each other about them. And they call these stories War Stories. Welcome to another episode of War Stories. I'm Tom. And I'm Chuck. And uh, we're back with Joe. How are you, sir? I, I, I wanted to just jump right into it because we had so much fun talking to you last time. And I, I just didn't want to waste any of that time. Welcome back. Well, I appreciate it. And um, I mean... I'm honored you guys asked me to come back, so I really appreciate it. So, <laughs> no I, therapy, I, 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 therapy, it, and I, I, t- I say this, Chuck. How many times do I say this? I firmly say <laughs> group therapy is stupid. I hate group therapy, and yeah. I say that knowing full well that this podcast acts as a form of group therapy. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyway, it's honestly it's funny. Yeah, it, it's your 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 stories were. Man, I could probably sit there and listen to those all day until you ran out of stories. I mean, right. to be honest, like the shit that that happened over there, and the and the the stories that come from each individual person are so much different. Some are similar, but they're all different, and they they're just they're so captivating, and it really it tells a story that that no one's going to hear unless they're they're shared, and they're they're amazing. I think they're better than going to a movie or watching anything that happens because it's live from the person's mouth and i gotta tell you the last part one was intense yeah i appreciate that because you just highlighted the reason why i i i do this and and commonly speak to people about these things is they won't get told if if people don't tell them and right um, sometimes you gotta swallow your pride and um you know it's it's like i said last time it's not about me it's not about you it's it's right. about the people that um, that got you where you are, and that's the that's what's important about what you guys are doing with this podcast and uh, why I'm here. So I appreciate it. Well, we we definitely appreciate you being willing to come back on, and I will say it as many times as I need to. Uh, Stephen Ambrose, if Stephen Ambrose doesn't write Band of Brothers, then the story of Easy Company dies with the men and women who lived it. You That's know, right. the, the, the husbands, the fathers, their, their, their wives that le- were left at home and then didn't barely recognize the guy that came home from, you know, the world war two, having seen everything from a drop into Normandy to Hitler's, you know, house in the, in the Hills. <laughs> so if Stephen Ambrose doesn't tell that story, those men don't get the recognition they so richly deserve. Yeah. Spot on. I think, uh, I mean, you just hit one of my, like that, that band of brothers, uh, series, not just, not just the books, but the, the stuff on HBO, um, affected me and I learned from that, you know? And so that's the value of, of this. And, um, I can't think of, actually, I mean, I can't think of a better example than what you just gave. That was, Yeah. yeah, yeah. But so I, I'm curious in the in the week that we haven't seen you, is there have, have you had any feedback from uh, from coming on? Has anybody said anything to you? Did we make you sound terrible? No, <laughs> no, I, I've got uh, I've got no feedback. I think people are generally used to me talking a lot. Uh, it's kind of what I'm known for. So uh, <laughs> they're like, oh, it's just Joe going on again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. But no, no, no feedback yet. I'm sure it will come. I, I work in the. <laughs> I work in the public affairs world. Um, so if I don't get feedback from peers, I'm sure I will from higher at some point. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, whenever it's the higher ups giving you feedback, it's usually from the rear. 
<laughs> yeah. And, and you know what, though? I think a lot of folks, um, you know, there's a lot that can be said about the higher headquarters people these days. Uh, but typically when I share these sorts of stories, the feedback's almost not the feedback every time is uh, it's complimentary and flattering. So uh, right. I think everybody, everybody wants people to do what you guys are making possible for us to do. And that's, you know, talking about these things. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's um, something we've discussed many times on the show and we've had, we've had grown men and women brought to tears on this podcast. And yeah. it's, the idea of talking to people who have been there, done that, got the t-shirt, you know, is a lot easier to swallow uh, yeah. for many people from who have been there and done that. So it, it also is not just easier to talk to people that have been there, done that, but also to hear it from people who have been there and done that. Yeah. I, I'll tell you as a, as a young man, I'll tell you, kids, a life lesson I learned when I was 19 years old. And my father told me, you know, I told him I smoked at 19 years old. I admitted that I smoked cigarettes to him. And, and, you know, he says, well, you know, eh, you know, I'm not thrilled, but whatever. I smoked a pipe when I was, you know, 19. And I was like, what? He's like, <laughs> like the corn my, cob one, like fucking Popeye. <laughs> well, but here was the thing, like my, my father, my, my church going, very conservative police officer, LAPD, Adam 12 father admitted that he smoked tobacco and to a kid who had grown up thinking, you know, that was, the, that was the devil, you know, or whatever. Right. I thought, wow, my dad actually was a human being before I knew him and it yeah. gave him more street credibility. Right. So mm-hmm. as a, as a young man, I realized that if I didn't live my life in front of my kids, warts and all as best I could and teach them early on that I've been there and done that. And if you're going to make mistakes, be original and make different ones. Cause you know, mine are old and tired. If I didn't give myself street cred with them, they were going to look at me the way I looked at my dad, which is, ah, the old man's full of beans. Well, it's the same thing here. If we don't talk with a little bit of credibility and then do it honestly, then what's the point? No, you know, it won't resonate with anybody. Yeah. 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 I, I, you hit the second reason why I like to do this and that's, you know, these, um, the police officer, the trucker, the veteran that's out on the road tonight, you know, here's something that I say and it, and it speaks to them and they realize that they're, you know, having a normal reaction to abnormal events like I mentioned last time. And, um, you know, the Gold Star families and the, the more importantly, not more importantly, but equally important to me is uh, the guys on my deployment specifically who who didn't get to finish the deployment because they were wounded. Uh, that's who I really hope to communicate to. Um, you know, the worst day of their life was the last day that they were there and uh, they came home early, which affects them. You know, they wanted to finish their mission, right. And they wanted to um, see it through to the end. And a lot of us that finished the deployment, we got closure. We got to, right. you know, seek revenge or we got to accomplish the mission. We got to come home to a parade and a homecoming and, you know, our wounded guys without legs and arms, you know, they came home and, and met a doctor and they've been working on their recovery since the day that they were wounded. So they're, they are in theory right. still on that deployment. It never really ended for them. Right. And yeah. They brought that, it home with them. They brought it home with them and they're still dealing with it. And um, their recovery and their injuries is one thing, but then just the, the mental fact that they didn't get to come home I relate it to like our Vietnam veterans, right? They didn't come home to celebrations and mission accomplished, well done. And, right. you know, I still talk to, I talk, well, obviously I, you know, can't talk to the the ones who are killed, but the ones who are wounded, you know, it's, it does still affect, they all, they every single time communicate regret and I always apologize for, you know, getting hurt and it breaks my heart and then it pisses me off immediately. Like, do not apologize for that. And so if there's anything I say, you know, between the last episode and tonight that speaks to those men and women that were wounded. Uh, that's who my audience is really is uh, um, th- it's those guys like welcome home. And um, let's talk about what we learned from, you know, the days that you guys got, got uh, hurt. But it wasn't their fault, you know, is the enemies. And so that's, that's really what I hope to accomplish. But there's a, yeah. there's a level of frustration that I can, 
longtime listeners of the show will know that I've experienced, which is the feeling of someone trying to kill you and the overwhelming frustration of not being given the opportunity to kill them back. Right. And it's, right. I know oh, it yeah. sounds, sounds, maybe it sounds weird. Maybe it sounds inhuman. Maybe I'm going to, I'm going to use the same, you know, the old joke, how many Vietnam veterans does it take to screw a light bulb? You don't know. You weren't there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I'd say, if you don't know, you weren't there. If that sounds messed up to you to say, yeah, I experienced frustration because someone tried to kill me and I didn't get to kill them back. I ask you, has anyone ever genuinely try, tried to kill you? You're if not, <laughs> no, no, I'm saying if not, I mean, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks very much for your input. I'll put it exactly in the file it deserves. Yeah, or, so I, or, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you go ahead. I was going to say, like, not being able to punish the person that was trying to, to hurt you, maim you, kill you, end your fucking life, whatever way you want to put it. Um, when you're not able to punish that person, whether it be if they fire uh, a round at you or rounds and you, you're not able to effectively fire back or you're able to fire back, keep their heads down, but you don't get any hits or you get hits and the person doesn't go down. Um, so you're not able to one uh, end that threat or kill that person. It's very frustrating. Or you get into a fight and, you know, or the person's trying to trying to kill you, but ends up giving up and you can't punish that person. You know, um, there's that. And then there's also the the court of law punishment when these people do these vile acts and they're not held accountable. And you're like, well, what's the point? Like, I did everything right. You know, I followed the law. I did everything according to the law. This person should be in prison and should be in prison for a very long time. And you're telling me you're going to give them a slap on the wrist and let them go. If that, that I think, yeah, yeah, that's the most, that's the biggest moralizing. It's demoralizing yeah, and i think that's sucks. what we're talking about is demoralization is it, yeah demoralization yeah i think uh and i don't it goes back to what you just says like i don't know but i'm assuming in the law enforcement side right like what you just described for us on on at least on my deployment at least uh the one i'll talk about that's the ied right like the ied is demoralizing because most of the time there's not someone there um, to, to shoot at or, right. or get revenge on. And it'd be, to me, that's the military's equivalent of the situation, uh, Chuck just described where, you know, this person just did this horrible thing and there's no accountability on it. Um, yep. I think we relate to that and sympathize with that on the law enforcement side very well, because I think, and I, this is a great segue into some of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight. So I, tonight I wanted to, discuss, um, you know, some very unique and weird moments. Um, the specifically like, um, the times when you want to just last time I talked about, you know, the officer's role is to prevent the, the possession, get becoming possessed and seeking revenge. And a lot of times that comes out in an immoral way. When you read a lot of the, you know, war crimes that were committed in the past, Right. Um, how do I prevent that? And so there, I'm, I'd like to share some examples tonight of those situations where those things were presented to us, but then how we were able to motivate, I call it revenge, although um, a well-planned, thought-out, informed decisions in order to bring that revenge upon the enemy. But I also want to talk about some of the, uh, you know, there's no atheists in a fighting hole kind of um, right stuff uh where there's just some unexplainable things that happen on that deployment that i think will probably speak a lot to your listeners whether they're military or first responders or not because there's some some weird things that that take place that i still uh i still after 11 years from you know that deployment i can't i still can't explain other than you know there is there is a higher power and i don't want to get religious but no no no. Here, here's the thing but, i'm very excited now first of all because it's october it's the month of halloween it's the time for spooky stories second yeah. of all this tees up tonight because chuck and i have to re record another podcast tonight for our other show and it's a part two it's a two-part series on spooky things and real life events and stuff so this tees it right up and so i'm oh. super excited and super stoked <laughs> and longtime listeners of this podcast will know that john and i have both spoken openly about our belief in divine intervention and a higher power. And we have both experienced it personally. So 
without further ado, then I, you're, the floor is yours. What is your story? I'm stoked. Okay. Well, there, there are several that will kind of weave into the overall theme, but I hadn't thought about Halloween. And so I want to get, I want to set the stage with it was 11 years ago to the month that I was in the middle of the Northern green zone of Afghanistan where wow. um, the cornfields were in full display. So think of like genetically modified stuff, right? These cornfields were 12 feet high. And it's like a corn mix. Yeah. I mean, just massive and inside them it's very humid. And so (laughs) just kind of a funny thing is like, what we decided to do is like, we'd be in the corn a lot and, you know, getting in contact in the corn sucks because the sound ricochets off the corn. So you don't know which direction you're being engaged from. It's also spooky because you can't see past your face. Um, and so one night we decided we, we decided we were going to have family movie night. It was like our first one. This is, we'd only been in country for less than a month. <laughs> I love that you we call were, it family movie night, family movie night. It was, uh, <laughs> it was one tiny little laptop and as many Marines as you can imagine, <laughs> gather around you know, <laughs> uh, just to have some, some time. And my dad would always send me Xanarin's uh, jambalaya and summer sausage. And so I got my first care package in the mail and we, we cooked up some food in this giant pot on a giant propane, like a uh, jet boil <laughs> had food. And it was just a little bitty bit for everybody, but we all had the same thing. And we're eating it. And we decided we we're going to watch children of the corn. Now, let me yes. tell you, this was the dumbest mistake <laughs> that we could make because we're patrolling in the corn the next day. And every day after that, and, and the little kids were like the children of the corn. Right? But, um, super spooky and to this day like i can't do a corn maze you know like it really freaks me out but oh i'm i'm gonna i'm with you i i have no desire to go into escape <laughs> yeah. rooms or corn mazes yeah. uh, literally i've been in the, or the hay bale mazes too so yeah. i've been been there done that have no interest real quick real quick is it just me or people who have had near-death experiences when it comes to the shit that you experience uh uh sir and then the stuff that we've experienced in law enforcement, I don't like haunted houses. I refuse to go into them, not because I'm scared, because I've conquered fear that's way scarier than that shit. But I don't want to hurt the person who comes out and jumps. That's out right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Oh, you mean like fake haunted houses? Because I was yeah, like, like, I'm all I'm all about <laughs> going in real haunted houses. But if you mean like no, the, the stupid, like silly, yeah, I don't go in carnival. I don't go to spooktaculars. Fright nights, fright fests, not scary farm, any of that stuff. Around. Because the bottom line is, is if you startle me, I might punch you in the face. Right. Exactly. I don't want to hurt someone. I mean, I don't mind going and like standing in the common areas and be right. like, people be like, ooh, and you see it. But I'm like me in a confined space walking through a house. I don't know what will happen. And I don't want to put <laughs> yeah. myself in that position because uh, who knows? I might, I'm, I'm probably going to to snap and I don't want to, <laughs> and that might be some scary shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you make this stupid mistake of watching children of the corn right before you patrol a cornfield. Yeah. How you didn't see this coming. I'll never know. I, I don't know. I made a bunch of dumb decisions. <laughs> that was one of them. That's been logged in uh, and <laughs> well documented. <laughs> um, when we talk about like the divine intervention piece. So I'll just give you a couple things. That I set the scene a little bit like, uh, several different events over the course of seven months. Um, there was one time when um, there was, like I mentioned last time, there were several snipers out there that were pretty legit. And there was this, this op we were doing where we were actually uh, part of the revenge piece that we were talking about where uh, my team and I, we had plans um, that we were going to go into the Northern green zone and we were going to um, initiate allow the enemy to initiate contact. So we have no kidding. Um, every excuse to fire upon them that we need, like we just need that. We need them to engage us yep. so that we can then respond and the literally response, say when. Yes. And so it's like, sometimes I wondered if uh, they, they kind of were on to us a little bit because it would take days sometimes to get them to take the bait. And I say bait because And and I'm very careful about that because you can misconstrue that in a lot of ways. But the tactic that I elected uh, my, you know, 
for my platoon to engage in was our version of a bait and ambush. And so move up into an area where we know the enemy was, um, purposefully act uh, unorganized, undisciplined, and purposefully soft target. In addition to that, having air on station already and or like timing our patrols based on when we would have close air support in the overhead that's high enough where it's not heard. Right. Moving to an area, move into a compound and vocalize arguments, um, like and visually uh, depict arguments like uh, where we're not getting along and then move into the uh, a compound, a structure and don't provide any overt security measures. So ba- basically look like a complete bag of ass. <laughs> While that's but, going on. I mean, and going- who is it? Who can't be drawn in by a bag of ass? Right. Bags of ass are very, very attractive. <laughs> that's um, right. But while that's happening, I've got my overhead ISR platform. So like my eyes in the sky, I've got overwatch positions that are um, very covertly uh, located and or even sometimes it's cl- like most of the contact we had was very close to where we lived. So we're able to see everything from where we're at. And so drawing the enemy into shooting at us and then the orders were always as we got very comfortable with this um, tactic, don't shoot back with overwhelming firepower as, as we were, you know, as the United States Marine Corps is known to do. So shoot back and so shoot back them, a little, shoot back a little enough to per, kind of protect yourself, but don't overwhelm them. Okay. And, what, and what we would see is, or at least what I thought we would see. And it, and it did, we were able to prove this tactic works is bec- we use the braveness and the um, tenacity of the posture culture against them, right? So the enemy that we faced, as I mentioned last time, was very, very, very brave. They didn't care if we were shooting at them with direct fire weapons. They did not like high explosive stuff. So the orders were go out, get engaged, return fire with your M4, you know, AR-15 equivalent. I'm not going to drop mortars. I'm not going to drop bombs. I'm not going to shoot rockets and I'm not going to throw grenades or shoot, you know, grenade launchers. We'll engage back enough to keep them interested. Then they will reinforce and they will reinforce positions at a uh, advantageous spot, usually a tree line that was very predictable for me to um, look at based on under. It goes back to what I talked about last time, studying, knowing the weapon systems that we were going to be engaged with and what, what those max effective ranges were and where the most likely effective range was. And then finding those terrain features that surrounded the area my Marines were. I could pretty much almost to a T pinpoint where those firing positions would be. So they get engaged. They verify the Marines would call me if I'm not out there with them, verify. Yep. Firing positions, just as we just as briefed. And then I'd watch and they would shoot back a little and then the enemy would shoot back a lot and then they would reinforce. And then I've got, you know, 13 or more uh, bad guys located at several different firing positions. And then comes the beautiful thing. You know, the, the, the cast nine line, the air support or the artillery rounds or, you know, the A-10 that's flying. Mm-hmm. Or the Singing Apache. that beautiful song. Burr. Yeah. <laughs> and then we would annihilate them that way. And then the guys would come home, get some child. We'd do family movie night again. And we would continue right. that process. And so that was how we kind of, uh, without giving like specific days, um, that is how we uh, learned. And that is how we eventually like completely annihilated the insurgency that was in my area. My area became secure. You know, I please tell me, I have to ask, please tell me I'm hoping beyond hope that this is now referred to in the Marine Corps manual as the bag of ass doctrine. (laughs) I wish. (laughs) Yeah, I wish. All right. Sorry. (laughs) No, there, there is, um, there is some value to this. It took, it took us taking what we were trained to do. Knowing that you have to know the rules before you can bend the rules. And so understanding the rules of engagement, understanding where the enemy were, what they're, it it goes back to that studying thing. And this tactic was very, very, very effective. We use it multiple times to the point where we we would even drop C4 in an area, make it explode, and then have one of the Marines screaming as if he stepped on an IED we would bring in the vehicles and run a Kazi back because they love to ambush the Kazi back. And yeah. then as we were planning for that, 
we had an answer ready to go and they quickly stopped. Uh, well, I won't say quickly, but they did. They ran out of people. We'll just say that <laughs> yeah. they ran out of people. Um, Big Trojan horse did. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. So that would be a good name for what this is. Um, but I'll go back into how it all started to where it all began. And it was actually uh, 11 years ago tomorrow. Um, we got a, uh, a report to my patrol base from a, a guy who lived out in the Northern green zone. He had this, he had this very, you know, um, humble establishment. He had a compound wall around his place and he had like, you know, a, a fairly small, you know, Afghan living structure inside it uh, with a few animals in the middle of the corn. And so he, he comes to us and says, Hey, um, I was gone yesterday working. And uh, the Taliban came in and they, they buried um, three IEDs, three or four. They buried some IEDs inside my place. I'd like you to get rid of them, please. So at this time, this is early in the point. We're like, oh, this is what they teach us. This is what we want. We want the locals telling us about these things. Um, so, yeah, of course, we'll go take care of it. The thought entered our mind immediately. Like, hey, what if this guy is like, you know, setting us up? So we. We went out in force. Um, I went on this particular patrol. Um, I can send you guys some pictures, actually. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Later. Yeah. Uh, but it's right smack in the middle of the cornfield. Uh, we go out there, and uh, my my lead combat engineer goes in and checks some things out, and he finds an ID right away, right where he's right where the local said it would be. There's an ID in the ground. And they were usually like 10 to 15 pounds of HME, which is enough to kill a guy my size. Or, you know, blow some legs off of a bigger guy. Um, but they weren't like the Iraq type of IEDs. They were very uh, meant to for an individual. And that like a landmine. It's exactly. It's a landmine. It's usually right. um, victim initiated. So a pressure plate. You step on, you know, it's two pieces of wood with some wire on both ends. You step on it and it compresses them. And then you get the, the, the circuit closed and it'll explode the the uh explosives underneath and just kind of blast straight up at you so we find that one uh we had eod with us they found the other one and then the other one so there were three total that's what we had and so this is where my mistake was made um specifically we found all three that's what was reported there exactly where the guy had said they were and so our we relax a little bit and our guard goes down and so i'm walking around the inside of the compound we kept most everybody out except for uh, maybe a fire team plus about six to eight guys. It's 18 hours. Um, we're walking around the inside um, and I see a battery um, on the dirt. Well, when I say dirt, I mean, there's the clay bottom and then there's what we call moon dust, which is like baby powder consistency. It just right. dust. Yeah. And then on top of that, this is the first time we saw there was just hay that had been like sprinkled all over the ground. And, you know, our first take is like, this is pretty normal. It's Afghanistan. Um, hey, everywhere. It keeps the dust from like poofing up and it made sense. But I see a battery and we've been taught in training, like don't leave batteries on the ground because inside they have carbon rods and the carbon rods um, can be used to help make IEDs. And they also don't hit on the metal detectors. And so it was like a C cell battery. I step off of the path where everybody was um, walking inside and I picked up the battery and I gave it to my lead combat engineer. And I said, Hey, we see these, we're going to pick them up because uh, we don't want, you know, anyone to get these. We'll just try to like minimize the market for this stuff. And so he said, right. Roger that, sir. Um, I have this great photo of me handing him the battery. Um, I do it like a little about face and I step off. He steps exactly where I stepped. And that's when my lights basically went out. Uh, so he stepped on the pressure plate that I was standing on. Um, the explosion happens. Uh, you can't hear anything. You can't see anything. And really your first reaction, or at least mine was like, what's what happened, right? I mean, I don't know how to explain an explosion inside a compound where the walls are 12 feet high and it's very small. That shock wave goes and hits the walls and comes back. And I mean, right, it the overpressure. yeah, it concusses you very, very, very quickly. And mm -hmm. I remember um, feeling like I'd been punched in the face by like Mike Tyson and trying not to lose consciousness. I don't think I did. And then it snaps into my head, like what happened? And I scream out 
I can't hear my voice because of the ringing in my ears and I can't see anything because of the, the dust, but I scream out for no one to move and start sounding off, you know, accountability. And I hear a couple like muffled things going on. So I'm hearing people and then I hear the screams. And uh, at that moment, I, uh, the dust is starting to kind of settle and I make my way around this, this spot where I was standing before. And I see uh, my Marine, that lead combat engineer in the crater of a, a giant hole. And I, I learned a lot of things from this particular uh, event. First was, um, it's not like the movies. It's not um, bloody. There's no blood, as a matter of fact. Um, he's in this hole, and all I see is his femur. You know, I see him laying in a hole, kind of in shock, and I see his femur on one of his legs, and it's just a dry bone, like a skeleton, and the meat of it has been like pulled, like with like you do with your hand, and it's like up on his chest. I see his vast deference, so like his testicles are blown off, and that uh, the the spaghetti uh, if you will is right. kind of there the entrails the viscera yeah and then i see he's missing some uh, por- portion of his hand and then on his other leg it's i see his tibia so i see his knee joint and i can see the meat there too but there's no feet there's no nothing and he's just kind of laying there still trying to figure out what's going on and um the thing i see very next is eod is already on him these guys were you know, this affects me a little bit. Like, why wasn't I there faster? How fast were they? Like, how, were they not rattled? Like, I, like I was. Yeah. Concussed. How did that take me so long? How, how did? Yeah. And they were on him, and they had a tourniquet. No blood. And I don't. I don't remember to this day seeing blood. And I remember. I remember him saying, "Make sure um, you take the cigarettes out of my stuff. I don't want my wife to see them." So they'd hit him with some morphine. So he's he's talking, but. Um, I'm now on the radio and it goes back to what we we're talking about before. I'm trying to communicate calm and I don't want to scream. I can't hear anything. So I'm just thinking I'm communicating, uh, what's going on. And I pass the CASI back information up and then we have the security that gets out the automatic. I mean, the Marines did a great job on the outside. And then we start going in the corner and waiting to get ambushed. And so that moment of like, all I want to do is get this Marine to a helicopter so he lives. Because, you know, it's like you're from more arteries and all these things. Are the tourniquets on good? And then it's like, oh, my God, is security on good? We just took a casualty, a bad one. It was loud. It was obvious. Are, um, you know, is any, are we about to get into contact? Because if we got into contact at that moment, that would have been a, um, that we'd have had a different story. Um, so I fast forward and say that the Marines survived. My goal with Kazivak was if I don't have to do a point of injury where I bring the helicopter in right there, I don't. Um, it's just not worth the risk. So if I can get him to a different base that's removed from where the action is um, before the helicopter would land there, then that's what I would do. And so that's what we did that day. Alert high, um, trying to figure out, you know, like that, that was one of the weird days where we did not get attacked on the Kazivak. But I tell that story to tell this, like, why didn't it blow up when I was standing on it? It's a question I still have. I think I have the answer to. I probably wasn't heavy enough or I might have been on the angle. Um, but then I go to that Marine um, who, I'm, who I'm in contact with. Uh, and you know what he tells me? He's, he always apologizes. He always says, you know, like, I, I don't have any stories to tell. I was only there like three weeks, you know, and, and that's it. And he, he went um, through you know, uh, Germany and then over to Walter Reed and did his recovery. And i tell you, I can tell you with full confidence, he's still on that deployment today. Right. And he still thinks wow. he let us all down today. 11 years later, he still thinks that he doesn't have a story to tell. And so I remind him about what that event did for us. And so we found the guy ultimately January 17th, 2011. We found 
the guy that put those IEDs in the ground and that was masterminding the IED emplacement in that area. And we, we killed him three times over. Um, how we were able to do that was all the events after that day that we, where we collected information and we learned from every single patrol that we went on to get the January 17th of 2011. And so when he tells me he didn't contribute anything, it makes me cry because he did. Like we learned about hay. We learned about the locals. We learned about complacency. We learned about how to treat a casualty, how to provide security, how to do a CASI vac, how to um, do all that while still reducing the IDs that we did find. Um, sure. We learned a ton of stuff. And so it sucks that we had to learn it in that manner. But for that Marine to think that he didn't contribute to our success, I might have three times more killed or wounded. Um, and had I stepped on that, I would have died. So this dude, he was like six, six two. He was a big guy. Um, and it blew his legs off um, without remorse. It would have killed me in a heartbeat because I'm a littler guy. Um, and so that's where his event, that, that one event allowed us to take uh, what we you know we commonly refer to as revenge, but we focused our efforts on tracking that son of a bitch down. Right. We found him. And the first thing we did was we blew his leg off. I mean, this is complete. Um, I don't know what it is. Serendipitous or whatever, but like, yeah, it's not, it's not, you're seeking to do it. It's just yeah, in the exactly. engagement. That's what happened first. And so what happened Too on bad, so sad. Yeah. And what happened on January 17th was um, it was that op I talked about earlier where, um, you know, we went up and got those guys, but that those snipers that I was talking about before, they engaged me personally during that January 17th op, which is another weird day because the bullets freaking curved around my body. Like I, there's, I see sniper bullet whizzes by ear goes between me and another guy and the way and where it hit the tree. It just didn't make sense. Right. Um, but a whole nother thing, but we wind up um, calling in a close air support mission from a, from a Cobra we put a hellfire mi uh, missile right on this guy and he, he didn't walk away, blew, like blew his leg off. But here's the, here's the perk was because he was such a uh, prominent leader in that area. The bad guys were going to Kazi back him. And so their plan was to get him to, to engage us while getting their uh, leader to safety. <laughs> so what they decided to do is get him to where they thought they were uh, out of our view. Um, and they were going to pump up a, use a bicycle pump to pump up an inner tube. And they were going to float him across the river outside of our boundary, which is pretty cool that they knew where that was. Um, so while they're pumping up the inner tube, <laughs> most ghetto yeah. Kazoo back. <laughs> oh man, I'm telling you, these guys were amazing. They were amazing. Like a, like a bicycle it's inner like tube a, or like, it's like, like a, a goddamn Bugs Bunny car. cartoon. <laughs> no, think about like a, that like a bandaid plugging up a hole. <laughs> no, man. Think about like. Sledding down a mountain on a tube, like one of those right. kinds of tubes. Yeah, yeah, oh, the big, big ones. In, yeah. Inner tubes for the truck tires and shit. Yeah, and so they were yeah. pumping this thing up, wow. and then they, the one guy would get tired, and the next guy would jump right in and do it. And no, 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 I got this. You, you take a break. I will. Pump yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, we're watching this whole thing. Like, well, I'm not. I'm at, I'm out there, but my CO has got the. He's got our um our eye in the sky watching, and we have a an airplane that's very high up that they couldn't hear. And they're watching this and they put another Hellfire missile right when everybody kind of got around the inner tube, right smack in the middle of the inner tube and got them all. Uh, oh. That was the last day we were shot at from that area, the rest <laughs> of the deployment. Okay. Um, so that's that event. But I think there's so many morals to that story. Um, it goes back to what, I, what we were talking about at the beginning where um, you know, our wounded folks, unless there is engaged leadership after the war, those people are still at war. Um, mm -hmm. They're still there. They're still living it every day. Every time they go to therapy and get a new prosthetic fit or every time, you know, um, they want to have a child or every time there's ghost pains when they think their legs are still there and they wake up in the middle of the night and realize like their foot hurts, but they don't have a foot. Right. Um, that's the world they're living in. And it's our responsibility as the, the ones who survived. We survived because of them. Um, that they need. Hopefully, they're hearing this now. Hopefully, there's someone out there um, that this can relate to. But they mattered, 
everything that they did mattered and everything that happened to them mattered. And at least in my platoon, we made sure, and I can promise you this, we made sure those bastards paid in every single, every, but it had to be, you know, done in a way that didn't put others at risk. No, it has to be done by the rules and by the book, but it, it gets done. That's what makes us better than them. That's what makes cops better than crooks is we catch you. We do it by the book. That's what makes soldiers better than insurgents. We'll, we'll beat you on the battlefield, but we'll do it by the book. We we don't have to stoop to your level. We don't have to capture innocent women and children and behead them to strike fear into the populace. We'll just use our better tactics and brains. We'll hunt you down and we'll kill you. Yeah, that's right on. And, you know, that, that brings me to a whole nother, a whole nother slew, another story when we talk about some divine intervention, but I'll, I'll talk about, I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, my luckiest day, my best day in Afghanistan. It's not going to sound, you know, like a great day to a lot of listeners until they hear the end of it. But, um, <laughs> right. The, it's all about perspective. It's all about perspective. And so my platoon, as I mentioned last time was, We were alone and left to our, uh, you know, left, basically the missions were left up to me um, and my sergeants while we're out there. And we had a lot of experience. And at the time of the deployment I'm talking about now is November. Now we're into November. There wasn't a lot. There were other platoons from other companies out. um, But for my specific company, you know, we were the ones that were kind of inserted in the middle of of uh, all the bad guys. And so our experience was just a little bit more than some of the others at the time. The, the others got theirs at some, you know, everybody got some, as we say, <laughs> everybody got a turn in the bucket. Yeah. yeah everybody got a turn. But um, this particular mission was frustrating to me because my CO calls and he's like, Hey, I'm going to bring you to a different area. So I had been for, you know, almost two months now making significant progress. Um, I had pushed, you know, like my first Marine was killed. 50 meters outside my wire. And now we're able to push, you know, a couple hundred, you know, meters outside the wire and um, not get contact until we like cross this line in the sand that was, you know, um, mar- actually marked by the <laughs> marked by the enemy with white flags is crazy. Right. We're making all this progress and I get told, Hey, we're going to pull you. We're going to send some guys out to secure your patrol base to keep it, but we're going to pull you to this whole other area and you're going to clear it. And this is like, when you talk about like uh I don't want to compare it to Fallujah because it's not like Iraq, but we were going to go house to house clearing right. um, through this area. And I was pretty pissed because I'm like, look, I made all this progress in my area that I'm in. I'm going to leave it for a couple of weeks and come back and all the progress I made is going to be gone. Right. Um, but nonetheless, you get a mission, you say, aye, aye, sir, it's a good order. And he's going to take his platoon that we, you know, we, at this point, we feel like we're a bunch of cowboys. Uh, we know, we think we're the best. Not true. I mean, maybe true. It just depends, you know, <laughs> if you ask me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah. But like, you know, the orders of the CO were like, hey, we're gonna pull this platoon that's already engaged and go do this other thing. That told us like, oh shit, okay, we're the guys. Like we're the we're his hammer when he needs a hammer. Um, so off we go. And so it's uh we're one day into the clear. Uh we occupy a couple compounds and hold down for the night at the phase line. Um the next day we wake up and we're going to continue to clear. And so what happens right up front is we'd already found 13 IEDs the first day. I think we were up the, by the second day, we're up to 20 something. They were just, they were everywhere. Wow. Wow. Um, we take a compound and I move my snipers to the roof to get overwatch. Uh, we got security on the downstairs areas, but I've got snipers at an elevated position. Makes sense. And they're looking for enemy movement and so on and so on um, and do encounter sniper. Um, one of my snipers um, is looking into the green zone. He thinks he sees something and he literally turns to look down at me. And the second he turns, he takes a round in the back of the head. It hit this Kevlar, it would have hit him right here. It was a well-aimed shot. Yeah. The round goes through his Kevlar, rides the top of his head. And then goes out the top of his head, Kevlar, knocks him down, knocks him unconscious. The dude lives. Still got that Kevlar. Wow. You know, PPE works. You know, we get him down off the roof and um, he's pale, uh, but he's pissed. I mean, <laughs> he, wants, yeah. he wants he wants to get back at him. But 
we run that CASI back. Day one, you know, day two's underway. We're continuing our clear finding IDs along the way. And, um, you know, the way we're running these patrols in this urban area is I'm using, I'm trying to run normal, uh, normal patrol formations that we were comfortable with and trained for in training, which became very, very, very difficult because if you're not sweeping with the metal detector, you're rolling the dice. Um, and so using my combat engineers to walk point. So just a real quick shout out to the combat engineer community. You know, I think history should and will remember the combat engineers as the heroes of Afghanistan. I mean, like they're walking point in a literal minefield with yeah. a, a, a metal detector meant to detect IEDs and mines that have metal in them. Right. We only found seven of my 67 finds with the metal detector. The rest were with your eyes. And so it was really just like a security blanket, but I try to run dual points. So two engineers in the front so I can walk attack column and clear as we need to. And so we're clearing through. Um, uh, sir, real quick. Yeah. Do you think that, cause I was, uh, you know, if he was assault vehicles and crew chief on a Mark 154 lane charge killing kit. Now they pulled a lot of us out of, well, they, they said that no uh, operations were going to happen in Afghanistan with tracks due to the basic terrain in the mountainous regions because we would skyline ourselves because we're too slow. But in, in situations like this, where you have massive minefields, do you think that those would have been utilized? So um, yes and no. Yes and no. So I think in this particular example, and most of where I was at, the urban area was so tight and congested, you wouldn't have fit. You couldn't, you could barely fit a Ford Ranger, you know, through some of these roads. However, though, and not to get down a rabbit hole, we did do an operation in December called Outlaw Wrath, and uh, we did, we brought in some ABVs and uh, we shot 54 Miklicks, um during that deployment to clear all the mines out. And so there were areas where that would have been useful. But I can tell you this, I and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I would have given my testicles to have a track, an LAV, or a tank, just one, just one, because. Yeah the confidence it would have given us to walk behind um, and employ the way that I'd been trained to employ them as a machine gun platform. I, no, and I'm not even being facetious. Like I literally would have allowed surgery to happen. To yeah. that, that, that so you're super thrilled with the Marine Corps move away from tanks. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot comment. I have no, tanks I have no tracks and I can neither fuck. confirm nor deny that center. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know this when we had those Miklicks, uh and the ABVs and just the engineer community. Oh my God. My head still hurts from the amount of explosions that, uh, that occurred. But, uh, but I, I digress. The, um, all on that day. So we got my sniper shot. We're clearing, we're finding IEDs, we're reducing IEDs. Um, almost like we are EOD. You know what I mean? Like we stopped calling EOD because there was just too many. So we got to the point where we take a quarter stick of C4, put a time fuse in it, drop it on top of a pressure plate and walk away and let it explode itself. Um, the risks with that are if it wasn't a pressure plate, um, or as a pressure plate that was also a command wire, you know, we could, it was just risky, but that's how most of them were. And that's how we dealt with it. So we're walking dual point. We're going through this little like compound that has some pomegranate trees. And there was a hole in the wall where um, a, a, the Brits had blasted a hole to move through, which is common tactics in Sangin because if you're taking the alleys, you're an idiot because that's, that's where all the yeah. IEDs are. But right. when you blow a hole in the wall, it creates a lot of dirt rubble. It's a great place to hide one too. And so my, my new lead combat engineer is sweeping the hole and he goes through it and he just gets kind of picked up off the ground and put back down. So it's what we call low order ID. So it was a 50 pound charge, which would have pink misted him in seconds, right? Only a, you know, pound of that went off because it had gotten mm. wet. And so oh, didn't lucky. break his ankle. A lot of times they'll break your ankle or, you know, fracture something and not blow your, your appendages off. But in this case, it just kind of like the, the earth lifted him up and set him back down nice and gentle. So that's number two, same day. 
Uh, my corpsman yeah. gets stung in the face. This is going to be funny. But it's just like, man, what is going on here, right? By the Taliban killer hornets is what we call it. I'm like, these things <laughs> would sting you and uh, you'd lose your entire use of your arm for a good part of the day. Like, Oh, oh shit. geez. Oh, yeah. They're massive. He gets stung in his lip. I'll send you guys a picture of that too. His lips like the size of my head. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, you know, that's basically like event three. Um, and we're constantly finding IEDs all day, which makes us feel good. The sun's starting to set. We're moving down an alley. Um, and we're going to re-enter uh, the compound that we had where the sniper had been shot in the head earlier that day. Um, and and stand by to basically post security for the night and get ready for the next day. Right. Cause we're moving down the alley, right at sunset at the other end of the alley. Um, a couple guys popped out one of them with a uh, RPK machine gun and opens up. So imagine two lines of human beings in an alley where you can put your arms out and touch the walls on basically two of two of my arm links is the width of this alley. So it's one of the wider ones. I've got two lines of guys and a guy pops out on the other end, be the equivalent of a dude with a machine gun popping out at the end of a hallway. Right. Um, and he unloads. Um, and so the rounds, it was like Pulp Fiction in a way. Um, we should be dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, that was an honest to God miracle, motherfucker. <laughs> we should be dead. Yeah. That that is how we felt. Um, I mean, not particularly at that moment, but um, my two engineers are holding. Metal. No, I'm sure at the moment you felt like he should be dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The um, the sun setting, which is uh, making uh, identification very difficult, but we could see this happen. Um, I'm I have two engineers in front and they're sweeping with metal detectors, so no weapons up. But the O three elevens behind them have their weapons up, and then I'm behind those guys. And so uh, the engineer on the right, he gets hit in the chest three times and in the legs twice. Um, and in the weapon once, because his weapon like explodes because um, he's, he's got it across his chest. His right. sappy plates stop all the rounds to his chest and his uh, massive legs, you know, stop the other two rounds. But he's shot through the legs. So I've got a casualty there. The engineer on the left uh, round went through his mouth and then but he turned his head in time. So it went out his cheek. Ooh, so, oh, shit. So through and through of the cheek. Wow. Um, and the rest of the rounds went between all the rest of us that were in the alley. So, and I, I'm not going to bullshit you guys. Like at the moment, this is me right here. This is what, this is what I did. I was like, that's it. Like, there was no, like <laughs> in that second, it was just like, why am I not dead? Right. Um, and it was just kind of like real. <laughs> I remember that going through my head. Like, you know, am I, Okay. Oh shit. I, we need to shoot back. Right. So it's like, right. That's when the engagement starts. We start shooting back. The dude bolts out of the alley. The guy that shot through the face, um, you know, he ran back to where I was, took a knee and starts shooting back. Um, and he's spraying blood on my face. Like he's got an arterial bleed out of his, uh, out of his cheek and the sun's now down. And now it's time to call a Kazi back into a very unsecure area in a minefield at night and work link up procedures and the whole, the whole chaos that would happen with, I've got a, a guy who's got shot in the legs twice. We don't know if he's got a femoral bleed or not, but likely. So he's got tourniquets on both legs. I've got another dude arterial spraying me um, who refuses to listen to anything I say <laughs> other than, other than I'm going to go get that motherfucker, right? Like <laughs> this dude just wanted Fucking to kill the guy. He, yeah, the classic Iwo Jima mentality. He did not care. He just wanted to fight. So he runs He runs down the alley, like not, not cleared alley, and just starts looking for the guy and shooting in every direction that he thinks he sees the guy. Um, the squad that was in the compound that was holding our overnight place, they identify a couple enemy firing positions and uh, a reinforcing element. They start engaging. So now the sunset. I'm working a Kazi back. I've got two wounded. I've got one squad just lighting up bad guys, and now they're decisively engaged. It's pitch black. I've got another squad 300 meters away through a maze of buildings asking me what the hell's going on. I've got our um, combined anti-tank team on a road 
thinks they see stuff, they start engaging. The CEO's asking me questions on the radio about where the, where the contact's coming from and where does he need to do to support us. And then I've got another squad at another location and we're all separated. We're not cut off or anything like that. But at my moment, like this is one of those times when it's like, what now, Lieutenant? You know, like, right. it's like, yeah. what do you do? And right. it's like, uh, this is where training kicks in, in my opinion, right? It was just like, we've got to reduce the threat and I've got to get these guys out of here. Well, my command made this very easy because we had this first sergeant who refused to listen to his CO2. When he heard we had casualties, he just took off on foot with the small casualty. (laughs) And so now I've got dudes looking for me to get my casualties out, looking for where to go. Um, And they don't even know where they're at. They're just, they heard we had casualties. They're running in the direction of the gunfire and they're going to find them. Right. Um, Ultimately they found me and scared the shit out of me because I got this hand on my shoulder um, in the middle of the night um, as I'm trying to, I, I mean, when I say the gunfire was intense, it was loud tracers flying everywhere. You don't right. even really know, you know, you hear the rounds cracking over your head. You don't know if that's dude shooting over your head to get the bad guys or it's incoming. You just don't know. And so the first sergeant shows up and he's like, I, I got, I got the engineer. I'm out. And he takes him back through a minefield through holes in the wall, like with the pulled litter and everything. And the next thing I remember thinking is like, sounds like the squad in the building's got the fight. Where's that kid that was spraying blood all over my face. That's looking for the, is he by himself right now? Like looking <laughs> for the bad guys. Right. <laughs> and sure as shit. Yeah. He's like, he's running all over the place by himself. Um, trying to kill people. I finally tr- grabbed him and I have to throw him into the first arm. I was like, first arm, do not let this asshole away from you. Like he needs to go. Thank God we did because that's how I found out he had an arterial bleed. Right. It was like, he needed treatment or he was in, right. in a horrible hurt, but um, nothing like having an, you know, RPK exit wound on your face. Um, Jesus. Yeah. So I can't even squad, imagine. Yeah. Squads got the fight at night. Casualties are getting taken care of. My other squads are trying to figure out how they can get into the fight. And at this point, I'm not comfortable allowing them to move to my position. And so as I'm observing this, I'm like, we got to identify where the enemy are firing from because they're not letting up. Um, and we got to put them down. So the squad leader, he's really got a good handle on it. I start, um, they start reporting like, Hey, they're running low on ammo. So we start talking about, um, getting an ammo resupply. We finally, uh, identify the main firing position. And this is what these bastards do. They know we're looking at them in thermals or with MVGs. They light a, look like a trench of diesel fuel. (laughs) As soon as we started honing our fire in on them, they lit this diesel fuel and b- washed us all out and they disappeared. Yeah. And it's quiet. And so working ammo resupply, trying to figure out what's going on. And then one of those, uh, I guess like one of their like privates, right? Like the, the eager, the eager Taliban um, decides <laughs> he's going he's gonna to engage us from the building they just went to. I got you now, asshole. Um, and so what we decided to do is, uh, I put, um, 60 millimeter mortars on the building, adjust them, get them on the building to keep them there. I knew it wouldn't hurt them because they're in like a mud structure, but the mortars would keep them there long enough for me to get artillery brought in. And that's how we ended the night was we dropped an artillery round, um, on that. But I go back to, you know, the, the as a long story, but the short answer to it is, uh, when you dissect that day. How did no one die on the American side? I still don't have an answer for that. Um, right. There was so many cases where, um, you know, I shouldn't have made it. You know, these, how that guy gets shot through the face. Oh, by the way, it made him even better looking. So he was like a model or something before he came <laughs> the room. And this little scar he's got, <laughs> a tiny little scar. This dude is a good looking guy. Um, Permanent um, yeah. dimple. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice little dimple, but you know he pain he is temporary. Little, yeah, glorious he forever. Uh, Chicks dig scars. He was awarded a uh, you know obviously a Purple Heart, but this is a lance corporal with a bronze star. You know, rolling around now and um, meritorious wow. combat promotion. And um, the funny, the great thing behind, like for your listeners who you know, what makes America great? That Marine, that specific Marine that was shot in the face. Uh, he was homeless before he joined the Marine Corps. He raised his brother 
He did not have a good family structure. Um, he shows up to fight with us in Sangin. He volunteers to go back with the next unit to fight in Sangin again. He's a, you know, a Lan- he was a Lance Corporal at the time, you know, a high valor award, gets out, gets an MBA, gets a degree, then an MBA, starts his own company for veterans, uh, or starts his own company, and then starts a nonprofit uh, to employ veterans in the construction business. So, like, you want to talk about returning quality citizens? Like, oh, yeah. That's America right there. And uh, he and let's I are good give, friends. Let's give his charity a plug. What's it called? Veterans Builder Group. Yeah. There you go. Veterans so if, if you're if you're inclined to make a donation, I'm sure you can find Veterans Builder Group online and make a donation to their charitable organization. Or if you are looking for a way to get yourself some help and better yourself, go for it. I mean, yeah. you know, if you're Fantastic a veteran, you need it. Yeah, that, that was my story for the night, really, as a, you know, I, I've got hundreds of these. Um, they all center around love. I think, uh, you know, like, I, it's like I said last time, like, really, it was the best time of my life. And like, the when I think about my life, and I look back, that time, like, obviously, you know, my memory is um, fading as I get older, and because of all the damn IED blo- explosions, but um I don't think I'll ever forget because, you know, I talk about it often, um, right. even when it's painful, you know, like um, there's been times when I've given these talks before and just broke down in tears and, you know, people like that cause it's emotional, but um, there is, they're truly like all those cliche sayings, like, you know, um, and even Bible verse was like, you know, there's no love greater than this. Like that's true. Yeah. It's these guys and gals and you can never, never, when we, when we, you know, watch the news and we learn about the state of America and, and all this stuff that's going on in the world, you know, it frustrates me and pisses me off too. And then I'm quickly reminded that, you know, like who I served alongside, you know, they're going to have children and uh, the American spirit will always be there. And yeah, and it's just, um, yeah. You know, I got to say one thing, no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends, I believe is right. the one you're referring to. It's, it's right. John 15, 13, and it's, it's completely true. Right. Yeah. I got to say one thing that, that, uh, d- that devil, he, he has the spirit of Chesty Puller and, and, and Bastlone inside of him to, to fight on like that after being, uh, to injured like that. And it just, that spirit lives on in him. And that's, that's pretty, um, that's pretty, pretty awesome. And then I have to say this, I posted this today and it was a thin blue line post and I put the, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, but, uh, Matthew five, nine, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be the called the children of God. And I think that really hones in on that day because you guys are peacemakers out there and you were the children of God that day. And we talk about, you know, not to get super religious or anything like that, but talk about divine intervention that right there is divine intervention right it wasn't your day i should have been you guys should have been dead but you weren't yeah because you were blessed you're peacemakers yeah you know chuck how i I view that is like um this is what it this is what it did for me so I, i can't speak for everybody but um days like that made me insanely i'll say it brave i was no longer i i got the feeling out there that i will not die and I got that feeling not because of pompous or, you know, ego or confidence, but because there were too many near misses. There were too many times when I should have bit a bullet and I didn't. And I can give you guys multiple other occasions. But what I'm trying to get at here is I don't know what my purpose is. It could be someone, one of your listeners hears this. And the reason I survived is that like, you know, maybe my son grows up to do something that's like pretty close thinking, but maybe it's yeah. some seed that gets planted in your audience. That's why I always say yes to these. Um, I survived for a reason. And while I was out there, I knew that I, I felt like a superhero, um, as many of my guys did as well, where we, if we're meant to go, we're going to go because our, our, our mission in this world has been accomplished. Whatever that is, it could be something as little as just planting a seed or watering one. So I, I don't know if I'm getting into too deep of stuff, but um, nope. I, I definitely felt like, and I've lived my life like that since where I feel indestructible because if those things didn't kill me, I've, I've got some kind of 
protection until I accomplish the thing that I'm meant to accomplish. And then once I've done that, uh, you know, I'll punch my time card out and, and I have no, I believe I have no control over that. There's just, I can't explain yeah. it any other way. Well, I mean, uh, you can speed it up for sure, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but if you let the natural course of events take what the, if it's not your time, it's not your time. That's right. That's, that's exactly how I feel. And, you know, like this guy, you know, like the guy we're talking about, uh, he's come back and he's done some great things. Um, but you don't have to do great things to make an impact either. Like you can just be you and make an impact. I'll give you another one with him. Like we were in another, he came back to me after being shot in the face. Um, and then we got into another pretty bad ambush, <laughs> like almost right away. He's like bad luck. But uh, he takes his metal detector like a freaking Spartan spear. You guys got the, you got the helmet on. Right? And, he, and he freaking chucks this thing at a, at a, at a uh, enemy fighter and nails oh, him. With awesome. it. <laughs> so Holy like it. Yeah, he's he's been credited for wounding an enemy with his uh, spear chucking abilities. Um, <laughs> there is there is no quit in that guy. Yeah. Well, before we I, so Joe, as we close, I want to give uh, if you have another person you'd like to dedicate your episode to. I know you had somebody for last week. Uh, if you have someone else, we'd like to give you the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I would like to dedicate this to uh, Robert Kelly. And his family, um, John Kelly, um, he is uh, one of my good friends from Infantry Officer Course. He was killed by an IED uh, just as about the time that the stories that I uh, discussed with you guys uh, occurred. And then uh, if, if I could do another one, Will Donnelly, yeah. I found out both of my good friends were killed, but I found out they were killed weeks and weeks apart. But. I found out on the same day when I got back from this mission. Um, but uh, yeah, Rob Kelly is uh, who I'd like to dedicate this one to and, and his family who have been just a, a very strong. You guys may know uh, the name, maybe, but his dad was the General Kelly um, and then oh. later on the White House Chief of Staff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he was just a great. And I remember he, reading an article saying General Kelly's son had died in combat. Yeah, he was uh he's one of my good buddies and um and uh I feel you know I feel for his family every single day. So and and his well, and his widow um who is you know they live right down the street from us and uh so and and you know, I I guess just all the fallen of 3rd Battalion 5th right. Marines during that deployment. Um, everybody's yeah. got their stories and I hope they come out and tell them. Yeah, we're happy to hear them. I wanted to, uh, it, well, I just want to say rest easy, brothers. We got it from here. Um, but also wanted to take us out on a, a fun note. I posted this on social media. Um, and we, we, we end on down notes a lot, <laughs> but I, I wanted to, to, to bring this up because I thought when I read it, it was a posted by a friend of mine who, uh, has been on this podcast who, is a Marine veteran and also a police veteran. So uh, he posted this. And as I was reading it, I realized, you know, we always talk about, we may not be on the same team, whether you're air force or army or Marines or police officer, firefighter, you know, we all have our little interdepartmental rivalries and branch rivalries and all that kind of stuff. And like we say, not on the same team, but all on the same side. Right. So, um, I wanted to read this because I read it and I thought, okay, this applies just as much to military friends as it does to police uh, and firefighter friends. So here, here's what it is. The difference between civilian friends and military friends. And you guys can tell me if uh, this resonates with you. Civilian friends tell you not to do something stupid, but military friends will post 360 security so you don't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> civilian friends call your parents, Mr. And Mrs. Military friends call your parents, mom and dad. Civilian friends hope the night goes out, uh, night out goes smoothly and hope that no one is late for the ride home. Military friends know some wild stuff will happen and set up rally points and an E&E route. <laughs> uh, civilian friends bail you out of jail and tell you what you did wrong. Military friends will be sitting next to you saying that was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> civilian friends borrow your stuff for a few days and then give it back military friends borrow each other's stuff so often nobody remembers who bought it in the first place 
Yes. Civilian friends listen to your relationship yeah. problems and hope it works out for you. Military friends will listen to you over a long, hard road match and march and help you straighten it out better than Dr. Damn Phil. <laughs> Civilian friends mm-hmm. know a few things about you and your military friends could write a book with direct quotes in it. Yeah. Civilian friends might try to hit on your girlfriend behind your back while your military friends will most definitely hit on your girlfriend. <laughs> <behind> your <back. laughs> uh, civilian friends would knock on your door. Military friends walk right in and say, I'm home. <laughs> civilian friends will wish you had enough money to go out at night and are sorry you couldn't come military friends will share their last dollar with you drag you along and try to work free drinks all night then drag your near lifeless body back to the barracks civilian friends want the money they loaned you back next week while military friends can't remember who owes money to who after taking care of each other for so long and civilian friends will tell you they'd take a bullet for you but your military friends will actually take a bullet for you so i just I wanted to to highlight that because as I read through that whole thing, I thought of my law enforcement family and I thought of, you know, Matt on the locker room and Chuck. And I, I just, I think of that close knit bond that we all develop going through the police Academy, the fire Academy, seeing human tragedy professionally, not, not, not because, you know, Oh shit, something terrible accidentally happened in front of me. No, like I signed up to go do something where I knew I was going to see the worst of humanity on a daily basis. Yeah. And these, this guy, this asshole standing next to me. Yeah, he did too. So automatically we have a whole different bond than anybody else on the planet. Yeah. And it, it it's one of those things where, you know, we get young listeners and stuff emailing us that they hear these stories and they decide to join the military. They decide to become a cop or they decide to become a firefighter. And let me tell you, man, while I, while I put my hand over my eyes sometimes and think what it's going to be like for you coming into this climate, this world, this society that we have as a cop, a firefighter, or a you know military man or woman, uh, it's going to be a fun ride. Yeah. Yeah. I've got two things to say before we end. Uh, one, to piggyback on what you just read from the post earlier today, but um your your civilian friends will will say that they're there for you and want to hear about your problems if you're having them. And when you call, they'll be like, "Oh, sorry, I didn't I didn't know that you called," or straight up ignore your shit. Where your military buddy or your cop buddy, your firefighter buddy, the buddy that you decided to you know befriend in a world of chaos and shit, will actually pick up the call. Will talk to you in the middle of the night. Will make sure that if you, they missed a call, they call you right back. Right. And really talk to you for hours, even though your significant other might be pissed that you're on the phone for an hour and a half talking with that person, but they're actually there for you. Yeah. Um, I've done that numerous times. Um, and I, I can't tell you what a fucking difference it makes with people and their psyche and, and shit like that. And it's important that that keeps happening. That's why it's such a big thing. You know, you'll constantly see it, those buddy check things like, Hey, you know, just making sure you're okay. Hey, you're all right. And, those are very important. And I see that coming from military and police and fire all the time. I never see it from a civilian. Very rarely would I ever see that. And that's the bond that we all share because we've all gone through the same shit and the same horrors and tragedies uh, may not all be the same story, but they're very similar in a lot of different and we ways. All, and we all uh, signed up for something greater than ourselves. That's right. Yep. Um, number two, uh, for all you out there who want to support us, um, please, please go to our website. Um, you know, it's uh, warstoriesofficial.com. Um, it's on our link That's in our bio. our store is, yeah. Yeah, it says website on it in big, bold letters. Uh, I fixed the link. It was <laughs> broken for a minute. Uh, figured out it was fixed. Uh, it was broken. I fixed it uh, by a listener. So it is up and running. Please go there if you want to support us. You want to sign up um, there and get uh, special episodes. Uh, sign up there also our store is there if you want to support us and our latest t-shirt stickers patches um and we have a couple cool things coming down the pipe uh, uh such as a hoodie um and uh maybe a surprise in the future but you'll have to wait for christmas time for that to come out we're gonna have so to make sure that joe joe gets one of our new special uh special items we're gonna have to make sure you know what? I think he would uh, he would shit his pants if uh, <laughs> we we'll just him. We'll tell we'll him. As, we'll tell him as soon as we uh, stop recording. But uh, yeah, thanks, Chuck. And uh, until our next episode, come home with your shield or on it. <laughs>